<clears throat> Greetings and welcome. We are in senior AP English. And our objective for the hour now is to finish our observations on the great poet Robert Browning by looking at maybe the most disturbing poem you will have read in your senior year. I said maybe. Uh, Prophyra's Lover. Now we read this poem at the very end of our previous lecture. So now we begin the process of exegeting. And, and, and I want to point out that there's a, I mean, there's a really simple way to summarize this poem. I mean, if somebody on the outside were to ask you, what is the poem Prophyra's Lover about? You could probably quote, you know, I used to love her, but I had to kill her, and now she's buried six feet under in my backyard. I mean, it is a poem about a guy who strangles his lover to death, no doubt. That's what the poem in its most simple language is about. But it seems to me as we prepare now to exegete more closely that there are several intriguing questions, especially given this is a dramatic monologue. Let's go back to 2B one more time. I told you in advance we would spend some time talking about this as a form of writing. The dramatic monologue posits a single speaker, like a Shakespearean soliloquy, who will then speak to an unnamed audience, and the challenge is two parts. One, identify the speaker. Two, identify the dramatic context. If, for example, we are looking at Tennyson's Ulysses, identifying the speaker is relatively easy. It's the old fart Ulysses. What is the dramatic context? Well, he's ready to leave and go on his final journey, leaving his somewhat aged wife. If you're looking at Robert Browning's Last Duchess, who is the speaker? Well, clearly it's this cat who did not have any time for his previous wife's frivolity, right? Happiness. He gave commands, her smiling stopped, and now he's looking for a new wife, maybe to subdue, right? To possess, in the same way that he possesses bronzes, like the one that was made for him by Claus of Ensbruck. We come to a disturbing question then when we pick up Prophyra's lover. Let's ask it now for your notes. Question one, and we'll try to answer these questions by the end of the hour. Question one, who is the speaker of this poem? Okay, who is the guy talking in this poem? What can we learn about him? To speak in the language of a previous lecture, there are some interesting Freudian kinds of interpretation of these speakers. There's things he says, there's things he does not say, and yet he's clearly saying them. Who is this guy? Number two. And this is a disturbing question. I'll ask it. You'll have to write it down, and then we're going to have to answer it. There have been some of my students who have said, you know, after we started studying this poem, it became a very, very disturbing poem to me. Question. Okay, he does strangle his girl. How does he do it? Well, he takes her long, beautiful blonde hair, he wraps it three times around her little throat, and he strangles the life out of her. Question, is it premeditated, this act? Does he know he's going to do it? Or rather, is the decision to strangle his girl an impromptu decision? an unprompted, unpremeditated decision. Question three. It only gets more disturbing. Question three. Does she know when she arrives that evening? Does she know what is about to happen? Or three, A, should she know? Looking at it with hindsight, over your literary shoulder, if you will, would you be willing to say about what happens, well, she might have been kind of shocked when it happened, but she couldn't have been too shocked. She should have had some idea it was coming. Well, you know, 3B question as part of this. At what point, if you had been a more astute reader, should you have known? I mean, Miss Klingler's observation or confession is, I think, normal for most readers of this poem. la ti da reading another poem. Right, right, right. Uh, he, whoa, 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 what did I just read? He did what? He strangled the life out of her. And then all of a sudden you find yourself doing one of these numbers. You don't even finish the poem. You just kind of go, whoa, whoa, what am, what am I reading? And you go back, question at 3B here. 
should you have known earlier? Browning's clearly playing a gotcha game with you on some level as the reader of the poem. And when you go back and start looking at the first lines of the poem, knowing what you know he's going to do, it's fairly self-evident then something's up. How could I have missed it is often the question asked by the reader. <coughs> How could I have been so blind? And you understand why we put 3B and 3A together. How could she have missed it? How could Prefira have been so blind? Question four. I'm hoping you're writing these down because I'm doing this extemporaneously, which means I'll have to be reminded what these questions were so we can try to answer them. I think I can do that. Question four. Maybe the most disturbing of all. We've always said that these dramatic monologues, a single speaker is speaking to someone. In Last Duchess, you have a cat sitting with him. He is the representative of a family of a young girl to whom this guy's going to try and marry. She's downstairs. He's impressing this guy with his portrait of his last wife. In Ulysses, you kind of have a sense that Tennyson has constructed a speaker who is speaking to my mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome to the thunder and the sunshine of pros, free hearts, free foreheads, you and I are old. Right? Okay. Question. In this poem, who is he speaking to? Because Prophyra is dead. And by the end of the poem, it's fairly self-evident. She's been dead for a while with her pretty little head lying on his shoulder. So who's he speaking to? Because it clearly ain't Prophyra. And his final observation is, God hasn't said a word about this. Which maybe is the most disturbing line of the entire poem exclamation mark for those of you who are close readers of a text. And by the way, that's really all the game we're playing. We're learning how to read closely by looking at poetry. Notice the exclamation mark ends this thing. God ain't said a thing about what I've done. Doesn't seem to be very remorseful. But who is he saying this to? Browning writing a poem where the speaker of the poem strangles to death his girlfriend, unties the hair from around her neck, and then places her on his shoulder, and he's speaking to who? It's almost as if he's speaking to you, which makes this poem that much more disturbing. Well, let's take a look at it, shall we? And on the way, we'll maybe even try to answer one, two, maybe three or four of these questions. Let's take a look. The rain set in early tonight. Notice context. The rain set in early tonight. The, notice all the adjectives. Hey, if you're going to be a poet, you want to know how to use your adjectives and your verbs. So in this poem, we'll, we'll identify. We're obviously looking at genius when we look at Browning's work. The rain set in early tonight. The sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. Put in your own words. What's he say about, the, what, about wherever he, it is he is? By the way, notice your tenses here, Miss Barney. The rain set in early tonight. What tense? Present tense or this is past tense, isn't it? In other words, earlier this evening, the weather wasn't so good. Really? In what way wasn't the weather so good? Nasty rain, wind is blowing. What is this thing about elm tops? What's an elm? <coughs> the wind's blowing so hard, the trees are falling over. Colon. You got to pay close attention to genius. Colon. Everything matters in this little poem. I listened with heart fit to break. Put it in your own words. What's he say? He confides something about earlier in the evening the weather wasn't so good. And my mental state was what? What does it mean to say I listened with heart fit to break? I was a clearly jacked up guy earlier this evening. Earlier this evening I was mentally a little upset. Earlier this evening. Notice as opposed to now. Which by the way is where we end the poem. In the present tense, everything is fine now. Earlier it wasn't, though, because the weather was bad. 
and my heart was fit to break. I was, how does one say it, lugubrious. That is to say, upset, mournful, right? When, look at the verb, glided in profira. What does it mean, glided in? Already we're getting a lib, she glides in. Which tells us something right away. He was alone, and then Prophyra showed up. And when she showed up, she glided into the room. Hmm. Already indications that maybe there's a bit of resentment here towards this woman. Keep reading. Straight she shut the cold out and the storm, and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. Oh, isn't this sweet? Prophyra shows up, and the first thing she does is what? She closes, every, closes the door, you know, turns on a light, lights up the fire, and makes all the cottage warm. Now, isn't that sweet? What a sweet gal, right? She makes the cottage all nice and warm. And shut out the cold and the storm, kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up the fire, and all the cottage warm, line 10. Which done, she rose. And from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl and laid her, look at the adjectives, soiled gloves by, untear, untied her hat and let the damp hair fall. So let's get this straight. We're just trying to, we're just trying to exegete the actual moments of the poem. He's sitting there. He's sitting with heart fit to break, listening to the storm. In glides Prophyra. Let's just itemize what it is she does. One, she makes the fire all nice so she warms up the room. Two, she takes off all of her outer garments that are soaked with rain, which tells you something. We'll hear it in a moment. He even says it. She came to him. So long in the rain she walked that even her hair is damp and the garments underneath her coat are wet. In other words, she took a little walk. Where is this guy's place? See, where did she go to find him? She took a while to get there. She shows up. She takes off all of her outer garments. And last, she sat down by my side and called me. So the first time she speaks to him, no voice Reply. No voice of who? Yep. Why? Kind of shock, probably. Shock in what way? Does he not know her? <laughs> well, let's ask this question of Sherman's. How well do you think these two know each other? Think about the events that have transpired, right? Schreiber just kind of smiles. Think about the events that have transpired. There he is sitting in the complete darkness and in the cold, waiting, waiting, waiting. She shows up. She glides in. One of the obvious questions is, glides in from where? The outside. No, no. Before that, where was she? Oh, oh, oh yeah. This is going to be a question for us. She was at the prom. He wasn't. He wasn't pleased. We're told that already. She glides in. She makes the fire up. She makes the cottage warm. He hasn't said a word. He's just sat there. She takes off all of her outer garments. She plops down next to him with her long, beautiful blonde hair, which is damp because she's been walking in the rain so long. He hasn't said a word. And she sits down next to him. When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist and made her smooth white shoulder bare and all her yellow hair displaced and stooping made my cheek lie there. Now, Miss Varney is, in fact, as the actress that she is, trying to get a sense of how this works. And she is absolutely right. We've got to do this together. <laughs> Let me get this straight, Miss Varney asks. So she comes in. She does all of her stuff. She takes off her outer garments. She makes her shoulder bare. She takes her hair and swoops it out of the way. That we all get. But then we're told she sits down next to him and she takes his arm and she puts it around her waist. He does not do this. She does this for him. 
What? I don't get it. So for example, he's sitting here, sullen and morose. She plops down next to him all happy. She's made up the fire and it's nice and warm. She then is going to take his arm and move it around her waist. She's gonna take her hair off of her shoulder. Most important now, she's going to lean his head onto her shoulder. As in, in relationship to heads, follow closely, this is significant for the end of this poem, where is her head in relationship to his head? Do it with your hands. Her head is your right hand. His head is your left hand. Are they here? Equal. They can't be, can they? Where is his head in relationship to her head? If his head is on her shoulder, it by definition must be below her head. Got me? Laid my head on her shoulder. Uh, we're, we're, just, we're just itemizing what's happening in the poem. Of course, some of you are already giving me this look like, yeah, but we know what this cat's about to do. Right. That's why I asked the question, do you think she has any idea what's about to happen? A lot of psychologists will play this game in the 20th century of realizing this is a very disturbing <clears throat> poem. Does she have any clue what's about to happen? Or is she kind of like you the first time you read it? What's up with this guy? Like, he's clearly upset, right? He hasn't said a word. And stooping made my cheek lie there and spread all her yellow hair. Notice the verbs. Murmuring. When you add it to Glida, you start to get a sense of the ways in which maybe there's some resentment that he has towards. Murmuring how she loved me. Dash. She too weak for all her heart's endeavor to set her its struggling passions free from pain and vainer ties dissever and give herself to me forever. Uh-oh, he's saying something here. He's saying something about her. What is this thing about vainer ties dissever? He says something about her. She, she loves me, but she's unwilling to do what? Cut loose who? What is this vainer ties dissever? Come on, you got, this is like reading, this is like a puzzle, guys. This is, this is funner than most poems that you're ever going to read because you got to try and figure it out. What is it that he's so upset about? Can you figure it? She went to the prom without him and she danced with the other guys, not him, because he wasn't at the prom. But now she's here with him and everything is great except for him. So down she plops. His head is beneath hers. And then she starts talking about how much she loves him, even though she's unwilling to sever all those other ties. That is to say, her other, for lack of a better term, liaisons. How's he feel about this? Take a look. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain. A sudden thought of one so pale for love of her at all in vain. He does love her. He says it right here. But it's all in vain. Meaning what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All in vain. Colon. So she was come through wind and rain. She clearly loves me. She came all the way through the wind and the rain to be here. Be sure, look, look at the physics of it. Be sure I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud, semicolon. At last I knew Prophyra worshiped me, colon. Surprise made my heart swell and still it grew while I debated what to do. Is this a premeditated act that we're about to witness? Is he sitting brooding saying, I'm going to jack her when she shows up? There is a right answer to that. It is what? Is this premeditated act? Yeah. Because he's probably going to take off after she left. It's not a premeditated act. How do you know that, Sin? You've been studying psychology. He gives it away right here. Well, the word surprise tells us everything we need to know. 
What am I going to do? 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 She's mine. She, did you see it? She worships me. And that's when I knew. She worships me. Yes, yes, yes. She worships me. Yes. Now what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I, do? I don't know what to do. Finally, 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 she's all mine. She's totally mine. She totally worships me. Wait a minute. Is this what all guys want? In Victorian England, is this what all guys want? A woman who totally worships just the... If you really want to take a guy off, all you got to do is compare him to another guy, don't you? Ouch. Right? Is this what all guys want? He says, I knew it finally. Prophyric worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly good, pure and good. Notice no soiled gloves anymore. Colon, I found a thing to do. And all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times, look at the adjective, her little throat around and strangled her. And then, no pain felt she. It's as if he's saying, oh, don't worry, don't worry. She didn't feel any pain. I made sure that I strangled her in such a way she felt no pain. Who is he saying that to? Prophyra's dead. Obvious, obvious, I mean, there's, there's only two options. Either he's sitting there with somebody else, like a police detective or somebody like that, who would be asking, or another person, right? Or Browning has invited you into the room to watch. You are witnessing it. Before the age of video cameras, you're watching this unfold. Question, did she know it was coming? See, this is one of the most disturbing questions for young women as they arrive on university campuses. How do you know who you can trust how many girls will report the morning after? But he was really good looking and he seemed really nice. And he was like, he held the door open and everything. And it was, it was, it, it, we were going to have the best time. I thought I could trust him. Of course, that's a disturbing realization for female readers of this poem, but that's nothing compared to what it means for male readers of this poem. If you work off of the assumption, and I think it's accurate, as Miss Sin was pointing out, he didn't plan to do this. That means he snapped. Male readers of this poem go, whoa, whoa, whoa. One minute he's sitting there. The next minute he's jacking her. What happened psychically in the in-between? The answer is, oh, we don't know. But it happened at light speed. One minute he's there. The next minute he's strangling her. And then immediately he's defending it by saying, don't worry, she didn't feel any pain. It's fine, it's all fine, it's good. In fact, he will say, I think she kind of liked it. In fact, he says that exactly. Keep reading. Notice he says, she felt no pain, no pain she felt. Notice, I'm quite sure she felt no pain. And then an interesting simile, watch it. As a shut bud that holds a bee, a flower that would hold a bee, I warily oped her lids. Again laughed the blue eyes, now though without a stain. He opens her eyes up. As he unstrangles her, the blood begins to rush back up into her head, although she's dead. He opens her eyes up again, only now her eyes, beautiful blue eyes, laughed. She liked it. And I untightened next the tress, her hair, about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. This is his first moment to show any attention to her. He kisses her. Burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head. Which troops upon it still? Where are the heads now? We've got reversal now, don't we? Whose head's above now? His head high, her head low, 
which is the way it should be. I took care of it, he says. And guess what? <coughs> She's happier for it now. She's much happier now. Watch how he finishes. Her head droops upon it still, brings us from the past tense into the... We're now in the present. Dude, we're looking at this guy. And there he is sitting with his dead girlfriend, her head on his shoulder. The smiling, rosy, little head. So glad it has its utmost will. She got what she wanted. That's what he says. She got what she wanted. She wanted to be with me. She said, I'd love to be with you forever. He said, I can make that happen. We can do that. Smiling, rosy, little head. So glad it has its utmost will that all it scorned at once is fled. And I, its love, am gained instead, exclamation mark. He is proud of what he's done because he did it for her. He did it for her. She said, I want to be with you. He said, let's do that. Exclusively, let's do that. Prophira's love. Notice that's not the title of this poem. The title of the poem is what? I'm teaching you to read close. He loved her. He loved her. He killed her because he loved her. Prophira's love, colon, she guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. Oh, she wanted to be with him. He made it happen. Be careful what you say to a guy because he might make it happen. Whoa. And thus we sit together now. And all night long we have not stirred. And yet God has not said a word. Exclamation point. Whoa. What are you going to do with a poem like this? Did he know he was going to do it? Did she know he was going to do it? Should she have known he was going to do it? And why is it that the abused seems often to return again and again to the abuser? That is an intriguing question. Women who are abused will often return. I mean, it happened last night. We know that. That over, what, what's the statistic? It's a scary one. Like 10,000 women last night had the ever-living snot beat out of them by some man. Many, of course, died because the man beat them up. But what's darkly ironic is that after some counseling, they go back again and again and again to be abused, often reporting the reason they do it is to help him. He's not really that mean. He just kind of acts out sometimes. Finally, it's an intriguing question to ask. Dude, what kind of mind writes a poem like this? Really? Robert Browning. What kind of mind constructs a poem like this? What is he trying to do in a poem like this? Is this a poem of entertainment? Are we supposed to finish a poem like this and go, yay? That's... This is a deeply disturbing poem once you kind of catch even a glimpse of what's going on psychologically in the poem. Let's say it since I've used the word. Browning is very interested in the psyche. He's very interested in the human mind. He's very interested in what happens to speak now in our word picture of the shoe factory story, <clears throat> in what happens psychologically to Sherman when he, A, loses his job, B, comes home to tell Ms. Anderson, his wife, he lost his job, C, Anderson goes out into the job market and begins to gain her own identity, economically speaking. Thank you. We'll come back tomorrow and we'll do Yates. <laughs>